Welcome, everybody, to, I don't know where we are. OK, come on in. Welcome, everybody, to our second installment of Resilience in a Changing World, which is the theme uh, we've chosen for uh, the Design uh, at Large uh, series for this, this quarter. Um, resilience should give you uh, a clue of what we're talking about here. And the reason, if it's not evident, is um, the right one. Uh, has anybody noticed the world is changing? Um, certainly the ones that the world that our parents grew up with doesn't look like the one we live in today. And I think everybody's getting a sense that maybe just a few years ahead will become increasingly unpredictable. Uh, if you're a student, you're wondering what you're going to do with your life because the world is changing. Um, if you're having children, you're thinking about what your children's life is going to look like. Um, and some of you are probably scared and some of you are excited, probably a mix of both. Um, and we're trying to use this series to kind of help you get a little grounded. Um, last quarter, we, we explored uh, different dimensions of resilience. We started off with a group, uh, two Hadads, a group of people who said, you know, we always want to do the best thing in the world. We always wake up and we want to save that world and be healthy, and yet we kind of continuously fail. Um, why do we do that? And they helped us understand why our best intentions aren't always met. Uh, and the rest of the series throughout last quarter explored different forms and different approaches to resilience. So in the same way, I wanted to kick off this quarter. Um, with a little bit of a, maybe a flip on the script of how we look at resilience, uh, which is actually just that, and again, bear with me, has anybody noticed that a lot of what um, we do in this world today is kind of handed to us? Um, we're gonna use telephones the way that people are telling us. We have our cell phones, our watches look like the watches that we're given. For the most part, we wear clothes that we get to choose something off the rack, but few, although probably a few, a few in this room are designing their own clothes. So as we, as we come into this changing world, I think there's also an opportunity full of you know, the AI and technology to, to take a little control uh, of what we're going to do in the future. And so we've asked um, Danica uh, to, come, to come tell us how we can kind of retake control of um, of our part of our future, what we wear, what we carry, how we interact. Um, and she's going to bring to us a bit of a different uh, perspective, I believe. So with a little pre-gaming, I want to introduce um, Danica Vallone here, our, our speaker. Um, and I'll tell you a few things. One, you will find almost nothing about her on the internet, and I believe this is Purposeful. That's hard to do, by the way. Um, hard work. This involves a, a series of robots and slaves who scrape things out of the internet. Um, but despite that, she's actually well known in the right places, maybe even famous, and maybe a little infamous. Um, she does run certainly the best, and maybe the only female and queer owned production company in Hollywood and maybe the world. Fabrication um, studio, way more and, specific. And to be clear, one of the things that we've agreed is none of the facts that I'm about to lay forth are true. <laughs> she was emancipated before the age of 10, um, and she's close. close. And she spent her, her young years traveling through the South <clears throat> with a very successful Hollywood, uh, soon to be Hollywood troupe um, that didn't know it yet, um, where she was putting on plays and scripting the future with probably not a lot of money, but a lot of entertainment. Um, so today, though, her production house helps build um, entire new worlds in days. While we academics are discussing things, uh, the companies she runs build those things and build these visions. So I'm, I'm hoping she will help us understand how far we can go with taking control of our future. And with that, I'm going to get off stage and hand it to Danica Vallone. Welcome. Thanks, guys. That was like 40% accurate, I'm going to say. Not bad, not bad. Too high. We'll try better next time. So um, I want to talk briefly about how I met Eli, actually. Uh-huh. And, um, and why we kind of formed the alliance that we have now. Um, I crashed an event 
Uh, I was absolutely not invited to. Um, and we, a small group of us, ended up, uh, it was a happy hour for the X Prize, and then we went uh, after hours to a local spot, and I knew of a whole group of fascinating characters, really, really brilliant minds, that I specifically wanted to talk to this guy. I know, I know. Um, and why? I mean, he, it was in the way that he presented himself, right? So he was wearing a pink scarf, a brown plaid jacket, Mm -hmm. and a very big mischievous smile, which if any of you know him, you know he wears frequently. Um, Eli, in other words, really looked like mischief, and I love mischief. Um, so that was kind of the beginning of our alliance. And uh, looks do matter. You know, we live in a time and a place where um, superficial has a negative connotation, and certainly, I live in Los Angeles, I work in the film industry. This is the pinnacle of superficial culture and I build appearances and lives for a living. I'm literally sculpting and conjuring objects and environments in which fake people live. Um, but in doing so, I have to kind of conjure the truth of each of these characters. And I'm here to tell you that the way that a person dresses and presents themselves and then the physical objects that surround them in the world tell you so much about a person. And it is the opposite of superficial, it is observational depth. So let's leave Eli alone for a minute here and look at some other case examples. We're gonna look at kids, a dozen kids from all over the world between the ages of four and nine years old. What can we tell about them from these images immediately? What are our snap judgments? And then if you look deeper, what lives are they leading? What does home look like for them? I'm gonna dig in a little bit later. This is Jasmine. Uh, Jasmine prefers to be called by her nickname Jazzy. What do we know about her? Four years old, if you can believe it. This is her room, surprise, surprise. Right? She lives in a big house in Kentucky. Her parents and three brothers live with her. She's in a countryside surrounded by farmland. Her bedroom is full of the crowns and sashes that she has won in her child pageants. She, even at four years old, has already entered over a hundred of these competitions. Indira, what do we know about her? She lives with her parents, her brother and sister, near Kathmandu in Nepal. Her house has only one room, one bed, one mattress. At bedtime, the children share the mattress on the floor. She's seven years old, has worked at the local granite quarry since she was three. There are 150 other children working at the quarry, some of whom lose their sight because they do not have goggles to protect their eyes from the stone splinters. Can you tell in the way that they're presenting themselves? <clears throat> Jaime, or Jamie, hard to say, it's in print. Nine years old, where does he live? Fifth Avenue, New York, parents own luxury homes in Spain and the Hamptons. How close are your reads, you guys, when you're looking at these single snap images of people? And do the rooms and the items inside of the rooms kind of belie greater information here? Um, Jamie goes to a private school, unsurprising. He likes to study finances on the Citibank website in his free time and hopes to be a lawyer like his father. He is, again, nine years old. Joey lives in Kentucky. He accompanies his father on hunts. He owns two shotguns, a crossbow, and made his first kill a deer at the age of seven. Nantio, 15 years old, a member of the Rendil tribe in northern Kenya. She has two brothers and two sisters. Her home is a tent-like dome made from cattle hide and plastic. It's difficult to stand inside. Lee is 10. She lives in an apartment block in Beijing. She's an only child and reduced to single child due to the one child per family policy. She hopes to be a professional ballerina. Ria Nan, Southern Scotland. 14 years old, lives with parents and brother. The area is now plagued by heroin addiction and gang violence. However, what's important to note about her is that both of her parents are also punk rockers. She had her first mohawk when she was four years old. Her parents helped her with it. They all sport the mohawks together. This is not an acting out, this is a belonging. That one may have been a little bit more difficult to read had we seen it on the street. 
Sharap, 10 years old, Tibetan monastery, sharing a room with 79 other boys training to be monks. Harrison, eight, New Jersey, only child. He attends a private school where hitting and teasing other children is banned. Uh, his mother drives him two and a half hours to his school each way. That is five hours in the car for her on a daily basis. Maria, Mexico City, home set in a courtyard. The security is very serious where she grows up. One of her cousins was kidnapped by a gang. Ram from Nepal, a brick maker, makes over 1,000 bricks per day. He works from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. in the morning and then goes to school. Samantha, nine, guinea pig and fish as pets. She is a black belt by the age of seven. She's won the world championship three times. So what are we to take from all of this? The point is that the physical objects that surround us, and when we're lucky enough to be in such a position that we choose to surround ourselves with, tell the story of us. So today's talk is going to orbit around two main concepts, our interaction with the immediate physical tactile world around us, specifically our relationship with what we wear and what we carry. We've talked a little bit about what it says about us, but why are we wearing what we're wearing? There's comfort, of course, safety from the elements, self-expression and signaling that we did discuss. There's also enhancement. And this is probably the area of the most interest and intrigue for here, uh, us here at the Design Labs. So the other piece of what we're gonna look at is what this means for us in the future and our relationship with the, what I call the capital F future and how that affects us on a personal and everyday level. So let's talk about that. What is our future? Is it this? Most scientists agree that an increase of just 0.4 more degrees will drastically change the world. And the world are dealing with record extreme heat. Storms have been causing deadly floods. You could have mass melting of ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. If we don't act immediately, scientists say the consequences will be catastrophic. Three degrees of warming is really disastrous. Dealing with unprecedented heat waves and drought. All day today, the rain falling so heavily and so quickly. Ten billion dollars but recovery funds are tight. Rescuers doing everything they can to reach survivors. I found this video by literally Googling if we don't act now. And do you have any idea how many videos came up? Like this stuff is getting pumped out like you would not believe. Fear sells. And yes, we need to be aware of these things, but also it is playing upon our sensationalism and our terror. A very dear friend of mine who may or may not be in the audience said, beware the peddlers of the future. Think about that as you move through much of these design and future oriented discussions. Here's an alternate look. We stand at a crossroads of accelerating change unlike anything ever seen in the history of life. It feels as if the future could tip either way. between utopia and apocalypse. The risks we face are daunting, but beneath the rampant pessimism for our future is evidence that humanity can not only survive the coming centuries, but thrive deep into the future. I like that one better. So over the weekend, actually, I came across the works of the brilliant Julian Bleeker um, of design fiction thinking, uh, and I utterly fell in love with it. Julian, we haven't met yet, but I'm going to call you. We're going to work together. Uh, and he said wisely that it is infinitely easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine a more habitable alternative. I, as I said, I work in this industry that buys and sells and chews and spits products and extreme emotions for a living. It's its lifeblood. I do it 24-7. And I'll tell you, the quickest way to build an empire is on fear. Bleeker goes on to say that the fatalist sentiment has been rolled around in the circles of critical social theory for decades now. F and A right, brother. So what do we do as an answer to this? 
Uh, and the words of a beloved grade school teacher of mine, be the change you wish to see in the world. I think she got it from somewhere. <laughs> she had good taste. As such, ladies and gentlemen, may I tease out to you the first ever public reveal of a secret project that uh, Eli and I are working on called NGEN. A small but mighty design group, think tank petri dish of brilliant and spectacular weirdos, outsiders, box breakers, because in the words of one of the great and hallowed philosophers of our time, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. RIP Hunter. So here's a little glance at a few of our pros, many of which you might find floating around in this room. And using embodiment design and the framework newly discovered by me, which fits in so nicely with what we've been working on, Eli, I can't wait to talk to you about it, of design fiction by my new hero, Julian Bleeker, we are gonna tease out what is possible and blur the lines between fact and fiction in an aggressive, thrilling, maybe even a little bit controversial way. You don't have to read all of this. It's just telling you I've thought about things, okay? Um, and I'm not at liberty to say too much at this time, but we will be having a gallery show later this year which showcases a living, breathing, tactile version of what this is gonna look like. Velvet ropes, layers of secrecy and intrigue. I don't think I can say much more or I'm gonna get in trouble. But what sets what we're doing apart, I think, is, um, is a certain flavor of diversity. There's a lot of talk of diversity now, but I mean diversity actually, and not because we're supposed to, but because it's simply better, it's empirically better. And I don't mean necessarily, you know, color diversity or gender diversity. I mean thinking diversity and background diversity, socioeconomic diversities. I mean, if we're gonna talk about resilience, be careful that you don't get siloed into the glorious ivory towers. If you wanna talk about resilience, where are your sex workers? Where are your ex-cons? Where are your people who are really, really scraping to get by and having to figure out incredible ways to survive? Where's your kid who worked as a brick builder from the ages of five to nine? Is that voice represented? So part of what we're doing is pulling from a radically far-reaching range of people that we're talking to and disciplines that don't usually talk to each other. In other words, as Eli intonated earlier, the film industry works faster than any other industry in the world, I would hasten to say. Um, money is no object, time is. As I sit here, I'm building four sets for a reality TV show for a royal family, not literally, but it starts with a K, and you've all heard of them before, household name, for the uh, new premiere of their show. Um, and the tools that we have at our disposal and use are not being cross-utilized by some of the heavier, more beleaguered, sometimes bureaucratic organizations, whether that's academia or government-based. So look outside your normal circles to move faster. This relationship between film and technology is a pretty important thing to lean into, and I might be biased, it's my area of speciality, but the thing is, Whatever images or ideas about the future we carry around in our heads, a good slice of them have probably originated in the science fiction that we've consumed and that have penetrated the broader popular culture, whether you realize it or not. We can think of examples together. I mean, what has informed your sense of the future? Everyone has seen the Jetsons flying cars, you know? Um, the first viewings of dystopian futures, pff, Blade Runner, I know that imprinted on me in an enormous way, cyberpunk at its core. Even things like James Bond, if you watch the early James Bonds, the thing that made him almost superhuman were his gizmos. But now you look at those gizmos, we take them completely for granted. I was talking about this a few days ago with a friend of mine and that very same day, the all holy algorithm sent me an ad for a teeny tiny camera the size of my fingernail on my pinky for $35 self-powered that I could put anywhere. I mean, that is like beyond what Q could have come up with in the Bond studio. So the paradigm is shifting and there's a very important symbiotic relationship between these worlds that I don't think is being harnessed to its fullest. 
So what kind of technology are we talking about here more specifically? Let's look at this example of a future visioneering I found on YouTube this morning by a creator called uh, Venture City. How far into the future do you want to go? It will be a future where AI becomes more human and humanity becomes more artificial. There will be Tesla bots climbing up buildings and sent to the moon. AI chatbots guide people through lucid dreams, a dream that they can control. Tunnel diggers are building an underground city on Mars, and fusion energy is used to power floating ocean cities and rotating ring space stations. It will be a world where humanity officially becomes a multi-planetary species. There will be lunar hover bikes, astronauts that enter cryosleep, and astronomers are predicting the locations of possible wormholes. There will be time cloaking devices, time where the speed of light devices. is slowed down to create invisible time. Invisible the biological time. and information age of mankind has ended. What we have now is the singularity, when technology moves too fast for humans to predict what will happen next. Let's take a journey into the future and see what technology is waiting for us. Cool. Okay, or is it closer to this? Robotic humanoids are becoming more realistic with each passing year. Thanks to the advancements of bioprinting and bioinks, living cells are printed layer by layer, growing and connecting with each other, forming biological structures. People are walking around with AI prosthetics. New True. skills are downloaded into an AI arm. I want the pump. Sensors and nanofilters are embedded in 3D bioprinted lungs. Companies work on making AI prosthetics self-aware, able to catch a falling cup before the user is even aware it has happened. This is 2078 for that. That is happening right now, y'all. Right, right now. So the time estimates are off. Some are slow, some are fast. And what we need to figure out is how much we can do with what we've got in this very moment. So there's a lot of really beautiful speculative works like this that are easy to come across, um, but keep gauging for yourself how tethered to practical reality they are. That's a big piece of what we're gonna be looking at. And here's just a little bit of like a gizmo glance. This is more tethered to practical reality. It's like Since the turn of the century, SDS. technology has rapidly improved. Our reality is now filled with things that were mere dreams in the past few decades. Seeing how the past has unfolded, I was curious about what the next 30 years would look like. So I did a little digging into what life might look like in 2050 for us. Let's take a look. He's behind. He's really behind. This is right now. If you guys have checked out, just look at interesting or far-fetched at CES. It just happened. Uh, incredible stuff. The rate of innovation is staggering. But what I'm kind of interested in is how that translates less into the highfalutin, big, you know, butts and seats sci-fi movie, and when and how it translates into our everyday to such a point that it becomes mundane, almost invisible. Right? Like the Rolling Stones, we've all heard of the Rolling Stones, right? And they used to be an edgy rock band and they got shut down and kicked out of things and now they're in Toyota commercials and they're playing in your elevator on your way through your department store. That is a model of extreme success, commercial success. So what is the kind of the life cycle of ideas and products? <laughs> so you might have seen similar graphs here, uh, trough of disillusionment being an important concept, but this is one of the kind of looks at what we're kind of reaching for in terms of pulling our trigger on some outlandish ideas. We are gonna be hype beasts because we're gonna be able to take the further reaching technologies, use special effects teams from Hollywood who wanna be able to pour their work into something that's a little bit more concrete and tactile and has real world values and usages, and then tease the idea out for the general public. Ultimately, what's interesting is that these things make their pathway through they become very, very commonplace, and sometimes every now and then they get to have a darling resurgence at the end of it. Like, I don't know how many of you have little like Polaroid cameras and things like that, but that's a, you know, a full cycle around of novelty of technologies kind of revisiting the world. 
right? 78s, 33s, turntables, yeah. Our sweet spot here is right in the middle. So what we're gonna be working to develop, and maybe many of you are in looks and examinations to be developing, is where that Venn diagram between what is possible and buildable, speciality of mine, um, what is profitable, I'm not too bad at that, um, and what's desirable lives inside of. And that's about gauging the cultural zeitgeist and developing your personas. It's about hearkening back to those kids that we looked at at the beginning and thinking to yourself, what do they need? What does this person need? And granted, the kid on Fifth Avenue is gonna have access to things before the ones in Nepal, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep pushing forward and trying to develop the technologies until it becomes so ubiquitous that it's gonna trickle all the way out to those places. So my area of expertise and overlap lives around this discussion of science fiction and its relationship with present truths and future likelihoods, but calling it science fiction is siloing it a little bit. It's narrowing it. We're, I think we're missing something bigger and something important. It is, in fact, storytelling at its crux. And um, storytelling, I believe, is central to our humanity, and that's important to hang on to in a time when we're really being confronted with asking the question of what is our humanity, is AI, the big elephant in all of our rooms right now, kind of closes the gap and starts to erode things that we might have thought were part of our identity as human beings. We have to kind of further distill and identify for ourselves what is at the core of humanity itself. And for me, my answer is story. From the very first time that our ancestors, pre-language, gathered around, had a fire, used their hands to gesture, from the beginnings of language, from the beginnings of image with petroglyphs, story has always been at the root of that. And at the core of our evolution as a species, it's, I don't know of any other thing in existence to date that can vicariously learn through other people's experiences. There's a profundity to that that is very, very special. And yes, our computational skills are learning vicariously on previous experiences, but the emotional resonant quality of that story is gonna linger. So maybe tomorrow, as silly as it sounds, when you roll out of bed and grab your raincoat and strap on your Apple Watch and slip into your sneakers, think about the story that you're choosing to tell as you do so. And that's it. Q&A, guys. Thank you so much. And thank you for giving the audience time to ask you questions, because I have a feeling they may want to. Um, I'm going to be like the kid delivering uh, tennis balls at a tennis match. Uh, if you have questions for Danica, and even if you want to stand up and give uh, a lecture, go for it. Um, but do use the mic because otherwise people online can't hear you. So um, first, just again, thank you for everything. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. And now who wants to go first and ask some pointed questions? Somebody in the back. Um, yeah, my name's Josh, thank you, that was really cool. I wanted to ask what story you are telling today with your... With the ensemble, exactly. the fit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I <laughs> Thanks for asking. Um, this is, it's a good question. Um, let me frame it a little bit differently and um, tell you one of the party tricks that I've used throughout my life that has gotten to me, into, me into some very interesting rooms and occasionally some very interesting trouble. Um, you can read a person and pull the data from them from so many different touch points, and when you really hone this skill, people will borderline think you're psychic. Do you remember hearing about mentalists back in the day? It was like it was a traveling kind of sideshow act. The majority of what a mentalist does is an acute read of a person very quickly. They work in teams, they speak in code, it's a whole thing. But um, I can do a little bit of that. So if I, let me pretend that I don't know me, and I'm gonna look at me um, and tell you what I can tell about this person. Um, there was a purposefulness that happened, right? There's a curation that's going on. Um, there's a flamboyance, definitely. Um, I'm signaling that I love art, 
I mean, it's like tip to tail. Um, and it is a very, very classical style of painting, but if you look really closely, all of the, um, the figures are heavily tattooed, wearing sunglasses or have piercings on them. So there's just like a little naughty twist on what is a very, very classical set of images. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it declares intention and it gives you uh, like a lot of artistic flair, I would say. Um, and I put thought into it because I knew I'd be talking about it specifically, you know? And sometimes I joke with a friend of mine who says like, Danica, you're so put together. Strategic. Um, my sweats, for example, I, I ordered a set of sweats that are uh, like they're a custom print job. They're space themed from a friend of mine. They're head to toe, they match. So it looks like I really, that, that there's a full ensemble and planning was made, but guys, I'm in sweats. I'm rolling around to the store. I mean, it's, there are little silly ways that with initial intention, you can bank on it and give an impression of a lot more focus than maybe you had to usher up that particular morning. Question from online. Cool. I'm gonna read it exactly as it's written. Oh, here we go. I have a lot of spooks hanging out online watching this, so I'm braced. How did she know we're wearing Apple watches? <laughs> <laughs> Do you wear one? Um, I don't. This is my grandfather's uh, old watch, actually. I am, um, I'm actually surprised that the mic is still working. I'm so allergic to technology, it breaks around me, you know. Um, so, no, I don't wear one, but I work with them regularly. I have a great appreciation for their design and that they have become so ubiquitous that I can, with accuracy, say, yes, you are wearing an Apple Watch. Everybody wearing an Apple Watch, please raise their hand right now. Yeah, the one with your watch on it, or any smart watch, you know? Any smart watch? Yeah. So we're okay, we're, okay. we're not the stereotype that wow, you make us out no, to I'm be. I'm impressed, I'm impressed. Um, I stand corrected, apologies. Okay. So more questions for Danica, or right next to the last question. Um, hi, this might be like a little bit of a loaded question, but um, how did you get involved in this kind of work? W the film production piece of it, or like the the engine science edge? Both? Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, Eli's story about the circus in the South, I think, the, here's the nutshell quick version of that. Um, I had the privilege of being swept up in a tornado that resulted in accidentally starting an experimental black box theater in Savannah, Georgia, way, way back when. Um, we had no money. We were so poor, we couldn't afford to paint the black box black. I had to dig through trash heaps and abandoned buildings and condemned old Victorians to try to pull things out of dumpsters to make this theater. Our first show, we had $500 to build 35 characters for a Neil Gaiman production, which, by the way, is a very high fantasy, very difficult to build type production. I suffer from a chronic uh, case of overambition creatively. Um, and we stapled tens of thousands of staples by hand. I'll never forget it, and my wrists will never forget it. Um, crumpled newspaper that we got from recycling bins on the surface of the things to make this place. Um, so like a, like a little MacGyver goblin of a builder for this theater company. Um, and it made a reputation for itself. And I started doing design work and direction work um, in bigger and bigger radiuses, New York, Dallas, and then LA. Um, I got the opportunity to be a um, creative director for a filmmaker, writer, storyteller that I adore in Los Angeles, which segued into my um, offer to be a production designer on a feature film. And the production designer, for those of you who don't know, in a word, is in charge of all of the physical world building that exists in front of the camera. So if, it, if it's a stool or a bottle of water, the production designer's team kind of oversaw how and why it got there and what it says. So um, I did this design work. 
I set myself apart because I have a strong engineering and fabrication mind piece. So I was doing a lot of odd custom builds and things that had not been seen before and I was doing them quickly. So I opened a fabrica fabrication studio and I saw there was a, a real shortage of female owned or queer owned fabrication shops of this kind. Um, and it was kind of right place, right time for that. And um, we opened at the end of 2019, so Me Too was in full swing and it became a lot more important for a lot of these companies to make it a point to feature and use vendors that are coming from, you know, not PBR, like hammer swinging bro dudes all the time. Um, which piece, like so much of my crew is that, I love it. You know, I'm not, no shade being thrown here. Um, but it's important to have a different voice sometimes. And as many of you probably know a little bit of, the film industry has been incredibly tumultuous lately. Um, between the pandemic shutdown and then a historic double strike, things are pretty scorched earth for a lot of the film industry. In fact, you know, Marvel and a lot of other big studios are pulling out of, um, of US filmmaking to a very large extent. So there's gonna be a, an enormous economic downswing. And um, I started shifting into rapid prototyping for aerospace and health-related industries using my very, very quick production abilities. And truth be told, my heart is very much in the direction of deep future technologies and space-related work in general. And so that's how I'm kind of transitioning into this world where science fa fact, science fiction, and how they relate and feed each other is, uh, is my Venn diagram sweet spot right there. Uh -huh. I have the mic again. Oh. We have another anonymous attendee. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I can't quite make sense of the question, so we're going to interpret it. Okay. It's hard to interpret. Let's okay, go I gotta with, get up anyway, I'm gonna stand up. Let's go with, um, what do you think, what you're doing now? How is this and what is your hope um, that it's gonna influence humanity? Whew, big Just stuff. Little stuff. Big stuff. Um, I think where I can be most useful, all right. I struggle with some pretty deep existential nihilism on a regular basis, right? The more you learn about the universe and how vast it is, the more completely insignificant and inconsequential we are, we are uh, empirically. And it's really hard to argue with that when you're zooming out. Um, and the way that I reconcile that is by giving myself permission to, sometimes I call it pretend and sometimes I call it real, but live inside of this story for this little chunk of time that I have. And if there's anything that I can do in the course of my life that helps to at all further um, our species, then that is time well spent. And over the years I've seen that the thing that I can contribute most is inside of that storytelling, um, this is kind of a loaded phrase. It's almost like highly focused, weaponized storytelling. And I say that with a heavy heart, but a lot of what I do for a living is commercial work that convinces you guys that you need some new beauty product or soap that you absolutely don't. Um, but I'm very, very good at it. And I can make you think that it's gonna fix your problems in 30 seconds or less. And that's powerful and it is a weapon. And I've been doing it for the wrong causes for a long time. And I don't want to do that anymore. And so that's why if I can start to use all of these different spheres of influence and allow them to coalesce into telling a story, bettering the quality of science and science fiction films, for example. You know, I'm sneaking in technology that is plausible into some of these things and the props, for example. Look at like um, Star Trek, the tricoder, right? Uh, early predecessor to the cell phone, that one gets referred to a lot. Um, I actually read recently that in the wars between the legal wars, the suing wars, between Apple and Samsung for the tablets, that uh, Apple was suing Samsung, and 
part of their actual it submitted into evidence case was from 2001, a space odyssey in which they showed a clip and they said, this idea precedes anyone's building of it. And they won their case. Like there's value in that. So I think my strength is in fighting against the trivialization of fictional storytelling and using it in a very, very pointed, focused way. We have more. Oof. Okay. Let's actually take a break from the anonymous um, online questioners. Is there anybody in real life in this room who would like to ask a question? Coming to you right now. Um, hello, thank you for being here and speaking with us, first of all. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, you talked about like bringing a, a lot of different perspectives and like really having like diversity as a forefront, especially in the NGen thing. And so I'm wondering like, how are you, how are you getting like the voice of that child in Nepal to hear? You know what I mean? So I wanna know the hows of that, because I, I agree it's very important. I just wanna know how that's possible. That's a great question and it is very, very hard because we're operating under certain guilty preconceptions of baseline, right? Like there's a baseline that we're gonna have a internet connection and a computer to be able to communicate with each other, which obviously that's, that's not a scenario in which they're gonna have access to. Um, but I do, it, it starts with having a declared intent and a really um, honorable intentioned focus in looking that direction and then finding people who can reliably speak on behalf for until those people that you're discussing have their own voice. And I will say that we live in a time when more people across more swaths of reality do have the opportunity to contribute on a world level than ever before and we are the recipients of much benefit from that fact. And to that I just say we have to keep going and I have to stay really diligent about looking for that. Who is the other hand? Going a little back into those previous two questions, um, what's a technology that you aren't involved in that you would like to see developed in the near future, like four years or so? Why can't I be involved in it? <laughs> sure, what <laughs> are you involved in that you want to see developed in the near future? Um, no, I, I just, <laughs> I'm a glutton for uh, like frontier discoveries, you know, and I just want to run toward all of it. Um, I can't be in all of these places all at the same time. So, I mean, that's a tough one to answer because it's sort of a yes and type structure for me. Um, as I intonated though, I do have a cursed relationship with technology, right? Um, so anything that is going to be very, very heavy computational tech, I'm gonna have to kind of like bow my head and uh, let the experts kind of take the reins while I help like zhuzh and window dress it a little bit would be more my relationship. Um, but yeah, quantum computing obviously is something that is going to completely change the shape of our species. And it's also something that's way above my personal pay grade. Right, so that's, I would say that's one of the buckets that I have the least ability to, to contribute directly outside of like the Black Mirror episode, I don't know if you caught, that touches really nicely upon what the implications of quantum computing could look like for us. Um, I can help with that piece of it, but in terms of the actual tech development, it's better for everybody if I stay out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm in the beginning of the presentation, you had the YouTube of the global warming and all the alarming things happening versus futuristic thinking, and it's easier to think about doom and gloom than, are, is your message to um, try to apply all the creativity to figure a way out of it, or you, you think the media is overhyping the global warming? I'm, I'm just trying to put that all together. Thank you for asking that, because I think it's important that I, clarify my stance on it. And um, it is, there are contradictory needs here because there's an enormous swath of humanity who is not properly concerned, right? And they do need to have help to understand the seriousness and the depth of the ramifications that we're facing. Um, but we're also, over sensationalizing to a really large extent. And what's gonna happen for those of us who are receiving the message and getting inundated with the message, there's a sort of desensitization that starts to happen. And that very quickly turns into um, apathy or forfeit. And that's very, very dangerous. So I think that there's a responsibility when you are 
triggering that fear response that you also couch it or ideally end it with some here's what the pathway forward could or might be and give someone like an aspirational pathway um, because I, I just don't want to see, I don't want to see it end on such a dour note. Like, I don't believe that, you know, and maybe that's, you know, incredibly idealistic of me, which is off brand for my nihilistic tendencies. But in my heart of hearts, that's the truth of me. Like, I'm a, I'm a secret optimist under my pessimism, and it's an elaborate uh, defense mechanism. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, I, it's, it's really just about um, leaving a little pathway or breadcrumb trail to a better future. Um, kind of piggybacking off of the previous question, just who are some of the authors, fiction or nonfiction, and designers that are exciting and influencing you? Um, Arthur C. Clarke um, is one of the best to ever do it, you know, in terms of straddling that line between hard science fiction that has real plausibility to it um, and knowing how to put butts in seats and entertain people. It's a hard thing to do. Asimov did a good job too. Um, Ursula K. Le Guin, incredible. Um, a lot of great short stories too, if you guys need some segues into. I have to be careful to not make like a, a reading list too much because then I'll think for the next like six months in a loop about who I left out and how sad I am about it. Um, but I think a lot of who we refer to in NGEN a good bit, and Eli and I talk about all the time, is Gibson. Um, William Gibson's predictions are kind of right on time for right now. And I heard a really incredible piece of advice at South by Southwest um, last year, actually, that there's a 50 to 70 year lag in the science fiction that's written um, and then to when you start to see it actualized. And so the advice was look at the science fiction that's being written right, right now if you want to get an idea of where we're going to be 50 to 70 years from now. Now, I think those timelines, again, like our, our rate of progress is changed. So I think that it, the gap is closing much more quickly. Um, but there's a lot of good stuff out there. There's a lot of trash out there too, and sometimes it's delicious trash, like a ho-ho or a Twinkie, and sometimes it's just real bad for you. Um, yeah. So I've got a question about a really, really fascinating presentation, and thank you very much. There's, there's, a, ch there's a, a real challenge between focusing on the opportunity of technology and the challenge of the far harder, way more entrenched and, and centuries old human problems of, of society that is, does, does focusing on, do, do you risk focusing on technology as the solution and ignore what are fundamentally problems that technology is not gonna solve? It's a good question and that's kind of my sweet spot a little bit because uh, it's about trying to win the battle in hearts and minds along the way to buy us time to get the hard tech developed and moving in place. Um, and it's, it's a philosophical question at its root that I think you're asking here. And to that I would say, are we better than we were 200 years ago as an entire species? You know, are we better off? Have we made positive changes? There's, um, there's a clip I didn't include that argues that, yes, we are. And there's a lot of really promising data to show that. Um, and um, there's a great book called Homo Deus that also argues along those lines. And I like that view. And maybe I just need to shroud myself in it so I keep marching along like a good soldier, you know? Um, but not despairing, I think, is at the crux of what is turning into my core message for this group today. Um, so it's easy to get discouraged. Um, and I would say, regardless of how much bad news and discouraging information comes your way, you've got to fight to protect that little fire and just keep, keep trudging with it. I'm going to ignore all of that, in other words. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm going to take it in the balance. But in the balance, I'm going to more heavily weight the good and aspirational pieces. 
I'm going to take us back to the anonymous um, questions. I'm going to summarize here. The first one, is there a still suit from Dune coming that's an N95 respirator as well for NGen? Absolutely. 100%. I, am I allowed to talk about that? I think you just did. OK, that's all I'm allowed to say. That's what that's code for. Uh, well, just a question. Is there anybody helping design that suit who we would know? Maybe you can tell us. I don't know that I, I don't think I can tell us. OK. Yeah. Maybe they designed other superhero suits before. Are we talking about the sweet Christian Cordella? Yeah, let's right give now? him a little name. Okay, drop. okay, yes, indeed. So one of the members of our team, um, Christian Cordella, who was not able to join us today, he's at work building some superhero for you in some big theater all around the world, um, is going to help develop the uh, the real life versions of these wearable suits. So a little trick here, kids, if you want to get free labor out of Hollywood, you go there and you say, hey, folks, you know, you did all this stuff for like nonsense, Hollywood. What do you want to say to the world? And they'll say yes. Um, this is our trick. So our second question, though, is I think related to this fine gentleman's. Uh, I'm actually going to try to read it closely because I think somebody put time into it. So how do you weigh the relative values of, one, pro-technology, cool products and gadgets, two, pro-human, culture, art, story, and narrative, or three, pro-organic ecology, well-being of all life? I can read that again if you need it. I think I got it. I think I got it. Um, carefully, um, with great fluctuation. Um, depends on the day that you ask me. Um, I think that it's a sliding, breathing organism of a scale. Um, I'm not trying to give a non-committal answer. It just is. Um, another really great friend of mine said there are two types of people there are um, spaceship people and there are canoe people. There are those of us who want to launch off to another world and get out of here. And then there are those of us who want to go back to the wilderness and paddle silently in our canoe and be left alone. And I said, what about the people who don't want to be left alone? And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, she's a great friend. Anyhow, um, I think that that question alludes to that a little bit insofar as you do have to hold these incredibly um, species changing technologies and all of the joy but all of the dangers that they present to us in the balance with our core kind of tactile organic canoe loving selves at the same time and that's going to become a really really personal decision um, bordering on a spiritual decision i would say um, and storytelling is going to be able to help present the opportunities for what that can look like for you does anybody want to risk being the last person to ask a question to Danica Vallone? OK. Ooh, there's more than one. We have time. For, let's, get, let's do both. We have time for two more questions and then a big thank you. Um, hi, I just wanted to quickly ask about your favorite project that you've worked on so far, and then also a little bit about like the future of like how you see AI and nanotech being combined. Ooh, these are, yeah, I'm going to do the shortest version. Um, special place in my heart for when I built the um, showcase prototype piece for an aerospace company called Worldview. It's going to do upper stratospheric balloon flights that allow you to see the curvature of the Earth. I'm giving you the overview effect, which is supposed to have a profound, profound impact that really makes you feel in your bones like we are all connected by one tiny, thin envelope of an atmosphere, and without it, we're all lost. And it blurs the boundaries of you know nations and what have you. That was an incredible opportunity to do something that felt like it mattered in the real world and was also telling a story. Um, and the second part of the question is going to get so granular and detailed, I don't know how to answer it with the amount of time that we have left, but come and talk to me afterwards. That's an excellent answer. So our truly last question of the day. Yeah, so since you're from Hollywood and you've seen a lot of movies, so I, I just like to, to ask, what are the couple of movies that, that gave you a lot of inspiration from a design point of view that we you recommend that we watch as well? Uh, Blade Runner is like my Casablanca. Like it's a perfect film to me, basically. Um, it's 
it is a lot slower paced than, I mean like the one, the original Blade Runner, mm -hmm. to clarify. Um, and then 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, those are probably gonna be the two pinnacle portrayals of future worlds that I lean on personally most often. Um, yeah, but we could go on for days about it. Um, so a follow-up to the question about where AI and nanotech are headed, we do have um, Andrew Hessel coming to talk about the fusion of AI, nanotech, and synthetic biology in this series. Uh, let him answer that question. Oh, he's incredible. He's a mad scientist. He's um, really incredible. Meaning show back up for the next of our, of our talks. Um, let's give a huge applause. Okay, everybody, be resilient. You are free, and remember, take control of the narrative and enjoy yourself.